Greetings, fellow investors. I'm Matthew Cochran, a lead advisor at Seven Investing, where it is our mission to empower you to invest in your future. We do that by providing monthly stock recommendations to our premium members and educational content that is freely available to everyone. Listeners, today I am very excited to introduce Rod Alsman. Rod is the managing director of Wook Capital, a private investment fund that believes crowdsourcing research from retail investors can offer a pathway to consistent outperformance. And we're definitely going to talk about that today. Mr. Alsman is also the co-founder of GMEDD. But more importantly, to our discussion today, he was one of the key players in the GameStop craziness last year. Rod, welcome to the show. Matt, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I want to like I want to set the stage a little bit, Rod, before I let you take over the reins. Um, so recently, I, I share this on Twitter, but yes. um, but my son said he works at AMC movie theaters and he goes, Dad, I want to take you to a movie. There's a movie out about stocks and we should go see it. So I was like, All right, you know, I, I, if, when my kids ask me to do something, uh, I, I, I'm just going to go do it, you know. Um, but I didn't have high expectations for this film at all. Um, you know, the, the film was GameStop, Rise of the Players. And it, I just thought it was just all going to be about like how the little guy took down Wall Street and evil hedge funds and how you can get in the trade now and it's going to go to the moon. And uh, I thought that's just what the movie was going to be about. And it did touch on all those themes, right? It, it relieved the craziness of early 2021 where uh, GameStop and meme stocks just took over the financial headlines. And, um, but more than that, in fact, like the whole first half of the film was really just about following this like small ragtag <laughs> motley crew of investors who just saw something, who did great fundamental analysis of this stock and said, you know what, there's real value here. And they, even as the stock price went against them, um, they, they, they doubled down throughout. And it was just a great tale of like, if you love investing, you will enjoy this movie, especially like it, it is. It's a fundamental driven story. And while it touches on all those scenes later, um, really, it, honestly, a lot of it um, reminded me of the big short when, um, you know, those characters were looking at like why the, the housing prices were in a bubble during the financial crisis. Um, you know, so I was surprised it wasn't telling people to crowd into this trade now or that GameStop was still going to the moon. And it just, basically portrayed it as a trade that had been squoze in Wall Street bet uh, Reddit terms. Um, you know, and honestly, I did laugh at all the memes and gifts while reliving the craze, um, but I enjoyed it much more than I thought it would. And the personal highlight uh, was when during the movie, I was going to follow some of the players on Twitter and I found like Rod Osman was already following me. And that got me instant cred with my 15 year old <laughs> son who was watching it with me. So I, I enjoyed that. Um, so let, let's look at this. So um, Rod, we're looking at it from 2010 to 2020. For 10 years, um, GameStop returned about 28%. While the, meanwhile, the stock market is just roaring. And, and there's good reasons for this, right? I mean, you had e-commerce coming over. The video game industry is going into a transition um, where people are downloading games. They weren't going to GameStop anymore to, to buy the physical copies of the games. You had all these trends going against GameStop. But and, and correct me on the timeline in a second here, but like at some point you and some others realized that like, look, there's, there's obviously a lot of trends going against this company, yes. but it's kind of being left for dead. And it was far from a dead company. And in 2020, um, like the, the stock market started to realize that in 2020, during the whole COVID craze and during everything else, like GameStop was up 210%, uh, while the S&P 500 was only up 18%. And then in 2021, I mean, this is one of the craziest stock uh, charts you're ever going to see. Uh, like, you know, it, it was up at one point like 1,800%, but finished a year up, up, up about 700%, while the, you know, the S&P 500 had a fine year up almost 30%. But, um, it, you know, it was just one of those crazy years where it just took off. Uh, and I know at some point you, you sold this stock and we'll, we'll get into that too. But yeah. like, so overall, the last three years, GameStop is up over a thousand percent still, while the stock yes. market has just returned seventy percent. Rod, I want you to take it away, but why don't you start? Just when, when did this come across your radar as an investor? Yeah. What was like so compelling about it? 
Oh, man, I mean, Matt, it's been a crazy journey with GameStop, to be quite honest. So I, I've had the luxury of getting interviewed a couple of times on a couple of different pods. Um, I would, you know, I don't want to spend most of our pod going into the deep history of GameStop. I'm happy to gloss over some highlights because there's a lot of really interesting detail. Like for someone like me, um, I got involved initially, actually, just as a teenager. I was always, I've always been interested in markets. So in the early 2000s, when I you know, was in my early teens, I'm born in 89. Um, my, my father had a custodial account set up for me. And as a kid, I loved games. I always saw the game stops by me were busy. And look, that was the extent of my analysis uh, in like 2000, you know, three or four or so. Bought it, um, sold it a few years later before I went off to college. Um, if you go back, you know, your chart started in 2010. Uh, the stock is very, very cyclical. It's very driven by, you know, replacement cycles for the console hardware that has been their legacy, you know, driver of gross profit is the physical video games that they pre they sell pre-owned software, which obviously, as you noted in the lead-in, though there are real structural headwinds facing that business as more and more games are downloaded. But you know, again, there was no deep analysis when I did it in the early 2000s. I was a younger kid who thought, yeah, video games are clearly growing. All my friends are playing them. These stores are always busy and it was a good economy. So I just simply rode the coattails, made some money, sold it. You know, fast forward to where the story kicks back in is like the late 2017 time, around 19 bucks is when I got in. I thought it was value. I thought that the stock had been sold off significantly. Yes, they have these real secular headwinds that they're facing, but you know, this company has a pretty impressive business. They do take in non-software you know, goods in their pre-owned business hardware. They were starting to dabble more with bones. I mean, there were plenty of mistakes made along the way. Again, if you want to hear me rehash like the whole history in really deep detail. I did a pod with Modern Guilt in December of 2020. Ironically, at the, the local low, the stock was like 1272 on December 14th when I recorded it. And you know it hasn't gotten anywhere near those levels since, but just kind of like laying out for an hour, just the whole in-depth history. Terrible management churn, uh, a death of a CEO, poor forays into um, adjacent businesses. They tried to get into um, the cell phone retail business and that was just a, a bust. You know, they, they basically treated the digital disruption as something they could you know, mostly ignore and say, you know, eh, it's, it's far down the pike. They really didn't embrace it early on. And you know, if we fast forward all the way to now, we can talk about what they're doing regarding digital. But yeah, 2017 started to dip my toes in in late 2017. And you know, if you look at the stock chart from basically then through, you know, it's trough in late 2019, when Mike Burry wrote the board a letter, uh, it, it's just a one way downhill ride. Uh, it was brutal. And I worked at a rider system, a transport and logistics company at the time. And there were a bunch of other MBAs who I'd have lunch with on a regular basis. And I'd be the only one at the table. Like, I'd be like, guys, no, look, the market's missing it. This, this price deterioration is more about sentiment than the underlying business falling apart. Yes, sales are declining. It's late in the console cycle. And it is a very much a cyclical business. It's a consumer discretionary that's basically going to have its sales fueled by new hardware console sales. So, you know, just to maybe bring us up to like 2019, that is when it became more clear uh, that the new console cycle, they were going to have physical disk drives in the consoles. And while that structural, you know, secular headwind of digital downloads eventually eroding the core business, uh, it, made, it seemed to me that it wasn't going to be this cycle that puts them out to pasture. And when you just looked at the valuation of the business, it looked like they'd be able to generate enough cash flow. Obviously, 2020 came along and you know, changed things up for all the other retailers, including GameStop. And we can talk about that. But yeah, I guess that's roughly kind of the thinking that I had. I, I thought it was um, oversold. You know, it kept getting more sold off. And it seemed like the price was disconnected from what I viewed as the underlying value. So, and, and it even mentioned the movie, uh, even mentioned at one point, like it would show headlines about GameStop is closing stores and how the market is interpreting this as like, see, it's going out of business. Um, right. But you and, and others were like, well, actually, no, this is a good thing. It's probably oversaturated in the market. It doesn't need this many locations. 
like just things like that, I guess, that the market was misinterpreting. Yeah. So I, that is definitely a good example where you see these headlines, you, I could understand why you'd intuit that if a stock or if a, if an operating business is closing store locations, therefore that must be bad for business, you know, fewer sales, et cetera. You know, the company quantified over the years uh, that they had north of 40% transfer rates for their store closures. And that it was accretive because the four wall EBITDA margins of the stores, even though the, the business at large, because they had so much overhead, they had so many stores, they had over 6,000 stores at one point. And they've cut that number down meaningfully. It's almost been cut in half from the peak. Um, but, but they just had, as, as I noted earlier, when I was a kid, there was a, there was a mall that had two stores in the mall and another store in a strip mall that was in the same plaza as the mall. So like, you don't need three video game retailers in a, uh, you know, half mile radius of one another. And if you looked at how GameStop's footprint existed, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of redundancy, a lot of overlap. And they were rationalizing the store base to transfer sales to either an adjacent store nearby or to their e-commerce channel, which they had neglected for many years and is, is being revamped now as we speak. But you know, the initial, I think, reaction from people is fair, but that's where you need to dig a little bit deeper and understand it's actually part of their GameStop reboot strategy that the new management team that came in in 2019 had established and was following. So it wasn't a bad thing. It was actually a good thing, but I understand why people felt that way. Sure. And so why don't you take us through like, so at some point, like the stock takes off in, in 2020. Now at this point, uh, and I want to get into like how it just took off and became like the whole, it started like this whole meme stock craze. But like, I know uh, like Roaring Kitty, uh, the, his handle on YouTube, were, were you following his, his YouTube channel at, at this time? I was an active participant in from August onward. It was a couple dozen of us and it was really a very intimate meeting place for people who thought the stock was fundamentally undervalued and we were discussing all of the various ways that we thought the company could realize a better valuation um it really you know as you noted 2019 is when things changed a lot you, you had a few things happen in uh, sorry 2020 excuse me there were several things that happened in 2020 that were really interesting beyond covid i mean obviously covid closed the stores and as I alluded to, they had a very weak e-commerce presence to begin with. So um, that was kind of a kick in the ass that they had to begin improving their digital experience for consumers. Um, so you had a proxy fight in 2020 as well, where uh, Hestia and Permit, two, two hedge funds basically, um, or private investment funds, uh, had a 7% ownership in the company. They had led a proxy fight around the same time you know COVID was just kind of coming into the, the picture they won two board seats um and it, it was crazy there was there was literature in the wall street journal at the time noting how crazy it was that you had a a proxy fight where only two-thirds of the votes were cast because the other third were black rocks and vanguards of the world lending their shares out to short sellers and it, it was just there was, a, it's hard to see on the chart now, but if you look, there was a, a mini short squeeze-esque event in that time frame. The stock got down to two bucks and change. It rapidly ramped up over six bucks because you had all these share recalls going on. The stock borrow fee skyrocketed to 200% annualized. You had a lot of really weird stuff going on with the stock in early 2020. Uh, and then it, you know, cooled off. You got to the late summertime and then, then the real massive you know external variable that no one could have accounted for i didn't have in my investment thesis was ryan cohen the founder of chewy.com filing a 13d saying hey i got nine percent of the company by the way in august and from august onward it was off to the races so to tell us one of the the hardest things about it about being an investor is a long-term investor and not a trader but like is when right, the right, stock right. really goes against you and like you, you believe you you believe you see something in the fundamentals that makes you think uh, a company is undervalued or that the market is not seeing its opportunities properly. But when it goes against you, and so when it dropped to two dollars, at this point you've been in it several years. What are you thinking at this point? 
So, and how so do you I would, deal with your, yeah. you know, that emotional turbulence, which I know you had to have felt at, at oh, some Oh, yeah. Point. And what was worse than the drop in 2020 was the drop in 2019. The drop in 2019, the company in late, in 2018, uh, Julian Robertson, Tiger's Fund, uh, had sent GameStop management in mid-2018 a letter saying, hey, do a strategic review, which they, th they then did. They did conducted this strategic review in the back half of 2018. And they concluded the strategic review at the beginning of 2019. And they said, you know what? That shitty cell phone business that I mentioned earlier, we're going to sell that. They sold it. Uh, they sold it for 700 million, which, you know, if you think about how many shares out they had at the time, it was like seven bucks a share. They had about 102 million shares out. So they sold that business in early 2019. And if you look at the chart in 2019, it's like uh, the stock was at 15 bucks, you know, while this kind of strategic announcement was going on. There was, there was rumors reported in the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg that Apollo or Sycamore were interested in buying the business out entirely for like 20-ish. I, I kind of had it pegged, you know, at 18 to $22 would be a fair price. Um, I would have liked it to be more, but I thought that'd be a fair price to get taken out. And they, they basically scrapped it. They couldn't come to terms, whatever, whether it was financing cost and the stock just plummeted. Um, they, they then announced they were bringing in a new leadership team. They, they brought and in this George is 2019? Sherman. This is 2019? 19. Yeah. yeah, this is 19. They brought in Sherman. They hired him. I think his announcement or, or hired eight was my birthday, 321, 19, um, turned, turned 30 and, and watched the stock fall off a cliff. It went from, you know, that 15 <laughs> point and by August, 2019, it fell down to $3 and change. So literally, uh, you know, an 80 plus percent drawdown from where I had taken a meaningful position. It, it had become, you know, my largest position. It, it was obviously declined meaningfully in price. And I added a lot come that point in the summer, which interestingly, at that point in 2019, it's like, what am I missing? There was this interview that came out a few days after that Ty Kim, who's now with Bloomberg Opinion, he was at Barron's at the time. He, he had done this interview with Mike Burry, you know, you, big short, right? You, you talked about how there's some overlap there. And, and interestingly, same character from the big short, Michael Burry, Scion, uh, was was in the name and, and he wisely exited the name earlier in 2019. And then he re-entered and later in 2019 after the stock ate, uh, ate it. Um, and, and there was a couple other factors going on. The, the company had, had been paying a robust dividend. They had been generating robust cash flow. They cut the dividend from, it was, I think, 38 cents per quarter to zero. And it basically was what I would characterize as a long squeeze. You had all of these institutional holders and or retail holders who were holding it for the dividend, who were forced sellers. Whereas in a short squeeze, you have forced buyers. These guys and girls were all liquidating and it was just falling off a cliff after that dividend cut announcement. Um, the company did a Dutch auction to buy back shares. They bought back some more shares in the open market around five bucks. They basically took the, the shares out down from 102 million to 65 million over that time. So, so even though we're looking at this price chart on a market cap basis, it was even more insane how depressed the valuation got when we got it down to, you know, two bucks and change. We're talking $200 million market cap for a business that was still generating $6 billion in revenue. Now we can argue over the profitability of that 6 billion in revenue, given what we talked about with the bloated cost structure, but it was just such a disconnect in my view from what any reasonable valuation should be. And, and part of that disconnect was what I viewed as you had a short interest that at that point got up to a hundred percent. And I've, you know, you, you've heard in the movie, Tom Barton, a very famous short seller talk about, you never saw anything like it. And he thought these guys are crazy. There's no way this company is going out of business. Burry said the same. When you look at the balance sheet, it's really not bad. You had another factor that came in. You had the, the uh, accounting rules change where you put all these operating leases onto the balance sheet in 2019. So it looked like their debt ballooned overnight, but it was just operating leases. It's not like it was new incremental debt. So there was so much stuff going on in 2019, but, but that was brutal. Seeing the position go from you know, 15 bucks per share early in the year to six or seven months later, an 80% drawdown. I mean, I can empathize with these growth guys and gals who have bought stocks, you know, in, in 2021 and seen that. Um, but yeah, it, it, after seeing that in 2019, 2020 didn't shake me in the least. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. And so now uh, let's talk about like, so uh, at that point, so at that point, you're, you're looking at it, 
it's a brutal drawdown. Do you double down? Do you add more? Or do you just yes. say, like, I need to hold? <laughs> yes. Like, yes. I was on vacation in Hawaii in August. Uh, it's, it's hilarious. It's a crazy thing. You just can't make this stuff up. And I was on my smartphone buying January 2021 at the money and one strike out the money call options on GameStop. Because I'm like, look, you have the console launch coming. You have a very clear catalyst coming in November or whenever, you know, 20. 20 um, that you're going to get the new xbox and the new playstation we know that the disk drives are going to be present so we know that there's going to be physical software for at, at least this next refresh refresh cycle so yeah I, I thought given the valuation and given you know yes volatility priced in the stock was fairly high and it's it's you know if you've looked at the implied volatility chart on gamestop it's it's quite a sight, especially when you include January 2021. I don't think I've ever seen a four digit uh, implied volatility, you know, over a thousand percent implied volatility. Uh, you know, the market broke during that mania week, which we can talk about. But no, I was buying um, and I eventually, you know, in 2020 before Cohen got involved, I, I think it was about 50 ish percent of my of my personal account. It was an insane bet. Um, I didn't <laughs> bet like Roaring Kitty did where he put, you know, deep out of the money calls on. And I made plenty of bad mistakes over trading around the core position, uh, which we could talk about too. But by and large, no, I, I was buying more. And I know that the mantra is don't, you know, don't losers average losers, but I didn't see it that way. I just saw it as a fundamentally misunderstood, hated, and severely disconnected from an underlying value stock with a clear catalyst coming up. And so now, so now let's fast forward. So like in 2020, um, I think you see some redemption there in the stock price. Um, but like in January, 2021, like what happened? Like what? Because like, okay, people, and look, I follow the market, right? And, and this stock, I mean, you could have, if anyone had pitched this to me at any time during this time frame, I would, <laughs> during, before January, 2021, I would have been like, you're fired. I, I was just <laughs> it off right away. Melting ice cube, you yep. know, it, it's, it's dying industry, dying business. It's, it's a legacy player, you know, legacy retail. I mean, so many strikes against it. I wouldn't have given it a second look, which is like, uh, you know, that my, to my detriment, obviously. But then in January 2021, when like, and again, I follow the market. Like when I become aware of this story, I'm just like, what is going on? Like, this is insane. So like, take me through, take me through that. Yeah, it's got to start in August of 20 because uh, that's when Cohen got involved, and and that was clearly a the founder variable. of Chewy, the founder yes, of Chewy. Yes, yes. So Ryan Ryan Cohen, found, co-founder of Chewy.com, he is now the chairman of the board at GameStop. But before he became chairman of the board at GameStop, he, as I noted, filed a 13D. He was going to be an activist. Uh, he had never done any of this before, and that spurred me and Roaring Kitty and many others to go dig into who is this guy? What's this guy all about? And what I walked away with was this is a very serious guy who makes very concentrated investments, who is seeing something similar to what I thought I was seeing. Um, I was rambling on stock twits and Twitter all about it uh, during, you know, from 2018 onward. And I jumped on social media because it was like, I just wanted to talk to other people and you know, understand why the mats of the world were so dismissive of this. And you know, I, I understood the bare thesis, but it was like, there's gotta be something else I'm missing. It can't just be that we are all so convinced that these structural headwinds are gonna put them out the pasture. Um, you know, Ryan clearly saw something similarly and he got involved. And you know, we talked about it a lot on those Roaring Kitty chats that, that I was mentioning, like, what is what is he looking to do? You know, we, I, I, you know, you talked about Wook, you introed me, and, and I think what we experienced, many of us retail guys who have maybe never been anything remotely like an activist, that you can uncover m meaningful nuggets of information when you really, really dig deep and you look beyond maybe just the filings. And, you know, I, I will, though, cite something that was just in a filing. When you saw Ryan file that 13D and you saw the lawyer he hired, you know, that's not something I thought to look for, but Somebody noted it on like a Seeking Alpha comment that, yeah, he, he hired Chris Davis, this like top tier M&A, you know, activist uh, lawyer from, from New York. And it's like, okay, well, Ryan's probably not just interested in being a passive 
passive observer here, if he hired this, you know, hotshot M and A lawyer, and and uh, and, and he's probably got something more in mind. So it's like, why, why would he see value in this dying, you know, brick and mortar retailer? And and I think it gets back to even though the physical software, like you noted correctly, is in fact a melting ice cube. Physical software, I don't think anyone's going to argue that, but for cycle effects, um, kind of bumping it, it's going to continue to take a lower and lower mix of share, a low, smaller piece of the pie. You know, digital downloads will continue to be a higher percent, but that doesn't mean that it's going to zero overnight. And, and I think that did offer them enough to transform the business. Um, so, so I'll talk through Cohen. He, he continued to accumulate shares from August onward. He started at 9%. He filed a 13 DA, I think to like 9.3, 9.6. Um, he, he eventually in November wrote a letter to the board. Before he wrote that letter in October, GameStop announced this multi-year strategic partnership with Microsoft, which again, if you're announcing a multi-year strategic partnership with Microsoft, you're probably not going out of business overnight, or presumably Microsoft has enough confidence in your business that you're going to be around. Um, and, and in that PR, there was a nugget of information where it effectively said GameStop will share in the lifetime revenues for all customers brought into the Microsoft or the Xbox ecosystem. And uh, I think in the movie, Justin uh, Doparala at Domo was, was noted as having reached out to management and talked it up. I think you can actually see one of my tweets below his in the movie clip that has it, but I also reached out to management and it was like, hey, when you guys say lifetime revenue, you're not just saying that you're going to participate in a small cut of signing somebody up for Xbox All Access, which is kind of the subscriber um, access to, you know, however many hundred video games that Xbox offers on its platform. No, it, what it actually means is that every Xbox GameStop sells an undisclosed sum of incremental digital downloads and activity conducted on that Xbox will go to GameStop as a uh, kind of referral fee, if you will, because Microsoft exited all of its uh, Microsoft stores a few years ago. They didn't want to you know, themselves be involved in retail, but look, you this is the only specialty retailer in this industry. The company has quantified at times that they sell more accessories. They attach you know, 3X accessories or or two to three X accessories and three X on games. Basically my point be there being, it's more beneficial for a Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, insert name here to sell through GameStop than it is through an Amazon or a Walmart or a Target because of those high attach rates. And yes, sure, they would prefer to do direct to consumer and retain more of the margin, but it's accretive to them to have this specialty retailer exist in the ecosystem. So more games, more accessories, more consoles are sold. And seeing that Microsoft deal, seeing Cohen take a larger stake, send a letter to the board in November, basically saying, yeah, I'm not happy with one seat, implying that they'd offered him a, a sole seat on the board. And that he's saying, look, video gaming is still a massive growth industry. Yes, the growth is coming from mobile uh, as opposed to console and PC, because you think about gaming and there's there's all these different you know, sub components of it. But he saw gaming as a growth industry uh, that GameStop could participate more fully in digital and in e-commerce, which were, as I noted, areas they had lagged significantly. And while they were getting their, their stuff together over 2019 and 2020, it was kind of like, yeah, COVID kicked him in the butt and accelerated it, but it was still too slow, was, was his view, and I think the view of, of many others. Um, so, so you had those things all going on in, in the fall and then winter. You then had December come along, and the company had its third quarter 2020 results, and management rolls out this $100 million uh, at the market offering where they're going to you know look to raise capital. And in December, the price, you know, I mentioned they bought back a third of the float in 2019. Well, the price relative to those levels by uh, by December was now, you know, two to three x. So yes, uh, it actually would have been a good trade if management did potentially raise capital. But I think it's not that they necessarily had the intent of using it right then and there. But the way they communicated that earnings call, you know, for my job at the time, I worked closely with my company's investor relations and corporate strategy and 
you know, competitive intelligence. So I listened to a lot of earnings calls and I was like, this is the absolute worst earnings call I've ever listened to. This company management is giving no, no one is going to walk away from this with any confidence. Management knows what the hell they're doing. The stock ended down, I think like 20% the day after. And, uh, you know, me and, and Justin and some of these other guys were like, what the hell is this? Cohen wrote this letter in November. And you know what? It was like, we want Cohen hashtag. We want Cohen. And we, 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 you know, I started reaching out to the different people that I had developed relationships with over the years of being someone who selflessly shared my own thinking and research on social media about GameStop. And I said, hey, look, this is what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to write Cohen a letter and say, you know, should there be another proxy fight come 2021, you've got our support. And I did write him that letter and I got 4% of shares out. So, you know, thinking back to what I said about all the share lending, like, yeah, 4% of shares out doesn't sound you know, like a ton, but if this guy's got, at that point, he went up to, I think it was 12.9%, and you adjust for all the, the share lending, it's like, well, well, damn, that that 4% is actually more like you know 6 or 7% when you adjust for all of the shares that are being lent, and his is already more like 20%. And it's like, wow, he, he's actually probably going to be able to win a proxy fight. So uh, come January 11th, though, he settled with the board. And I think it was because he likely would have won if they had gone to a fight. He settled for three board seats on January 11th. Uh, I wrote him the letter in late December. I have no clue, you know, how much of a direct impact my letter made uh, on saying, you know, hey, us retail guys, you know, we're in your corner too, so to speak. Um, but, but there was a settlement on the 11th. And remember, short interest at that time was still over, you know, or around 100% of shares out. So, so you had this really bloated trade on the short side. And I think that's when it began to unwind because then it's like, okay, now you've got a tech guy who's got the chops, who's shown he can beat Amazon head to head with Chewy. And he's now on the board with two of his prior, you know, Chewy guys, Jim Groob and Alan Atoll. So clearly this is no longer going to be, uh, is no longer going to be, you know, the GameStop of old, at least for people like me who'd been watching it very closely. And I think other investors were seeing it similarly and, and people had been buying it over the tail half of 2020 uh, because of Cohen's involvement, some. So from there, I, I heard that there was a big cover by one of the larger shorts, um, Sophos Capital. I have no clue if that's 100% accurate, but I heard that on, on the 13th when the stock doubled from you know the high teens to about 40. Uh, and then it got super condensed from there. Um, from, from then, you know, I'll, I'll pause because I just rambled a lot, Matt, but from then it, it became just a complete blur. No, that's great. <laughs> so yeah, so let's, so you, you, you've been in this stock for years. You thought it was, uh, uh, you know, dislocated from its fundamentals. But now it gets, at some point, it gets dislocated from its fundamentals yes. going the other way. So, so at what point, at what point, like, do you, do you realize, one, this is bigger than just a normal fundamental driven, fundamental driven story with a short squeeze on top? Like, when you're like, this is something that has become bigger than, than yeah. us or bigger than fundamentals. And at what point do you say, you know what? I need to, I have yeah. a fantastic trade, but it's time to get out. Yeah. So it started, you know, I mentioned that settlement was on, I think it was Monday, the 11th on Wednesday, the 13th of January, it, it doubled. Um, later that week, Andrew left at Citroen. It said, yeah, I'm going to come out with a short report. This thing's going to go back to 20 fast was the famous line he had. Um, you know, we, me and the other people who I'd been talking with on Reddit and Discord and all over, you know, really the most closely following it, it was like, you know what, people still don't get it. Um, people think, oh, it's up a lot, therefore it's it's exhausted what it, you know, it's returned to fair value, whatever. They think, okay, if I look at the chart, it looks it looks about right. I should sell. And we're like, no, I don't, I don't think that that's right. We we said let's gather up everything we've worked on in terms of, you know, understanding that there's upside optionality with Cohen in a bull case. Um, we did this before he was named chairman. This was after the settlement. This was like January, uh, I think we published it January 19th. We did the work on Martin Luther King weekend, the long weekend. So it was like, let's gather up everything. Um, you know, th there is a lot of, I think, good work in, in our original report that we published that day. There's, you know, the embedded depletion curves. One of the guys we worked with was an oil and gas guy. So thinking about software, you know, you sell the console, that's your 
you know, that's your, uh, your well, right? And you're going to have incremental game sales over the years. And we just kind of modeled out what were the historical depletion curves. Let's make an adjustment for mix, for software to, to digital. Um, and, and we embedded all of that. We, we said, look, you know, we think they're also working on more. Uh, the company had previously, and, and I had identified they were launching targeted ads on the website. So we were like, is there some sort of an ad tech business? Because they have tens of millions of customers and that's value that they have the purchase habits of tens of millions of gamers that they know across ecosystem. Whereas Microsoft might only know what you buy on Xbox and Sony only knows what you buy on PlayStation. GameStop should know what a power of rewards loyalty member buys everywhere, um, that there's untapped and unrealized value there. And we modeled it out. We put that research out and said, yeah, our bull case, you know, was a 15 X exit EBIT at 2023, based on where we saw the business being in 2023, which, you know, we, we, we modified to add meme energy to it. We made the price 169.42, uh, and that was, you know, 15.2 X EBIT. We made a joke. Yeah. That's, you know, Ryan's poodle bumps the multiple, but the base case was still like $80. And, and the stock at that point was like 39 or $40. So I was like, no, there's still meaningful upside here. So we put that but, out. But do, we, you, do you take as for your portfolio management, do you take like a little off the table and say, okay, I made my money back a little bit and it's time to like, <laughs> maybe not have this be 50% of my portfolio. Yeah. 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 And, and I'll look, you're, you're hundred percent right. I, I probably waited longer than I should have to start to size down. So I initially took a chunk of shares off. I had written some $60 was the deepest uh, strike on calls expiring January 22nd, the week before it became a full on mania. So I had written a handful of $60 strike eight of them, um, which was like a relatively small percent of my position, but it basically was going to take out, you know, what was that like $48,000 if they got assigned um, 600 shares at, at um, or sorry, uh, 800 shares at 60. So that would have almost taken, you know, my initial capital out at that point, which, you know, the stock was trading at like 40 bucks at the market open on that Friday, the 22nd. So I had no sense that I needed to close out my $60, you know, calls. Uh, lo and behold, that Friday is when things really just went haywire and stock ran from you know, mid 40s up to, I think it, it hit 76 and it closed at 65. So that weekend then, uh, it was just like, what's coming next? The stock has now closed at an all time well, I'm over high. 50% in one day. Right, so I lost a chunk of shares you know, to assignment that day, but I still had a lot of shares. Um, and a little, a little other tidbit, I, I had de-risked my position significantly in early January because I had uncovered through this like painstakingly uh, in-depth analysis, I had uncovered as a byproduct of being a consumer of GameStop's products that their e-commerce order numbers were sequential. So I had built a financial model and crowdsourced order numbers from consumers to basically see how was their e-commerce result looking. Um, I ended up being very close to the fourth quarter results, not that by March 2021 it mattered. Um, so much, but I had been tracking, you know, what their e-commerce results were like. So, so I had all of that in my head and I knew that holiday sales were going to be weak, which they were. I just didn't know that the same day they reported holiday sales on the 11th was going to be the day they announced the settlement with Cohen. Um, so I de-risked a lot of my call options. <laughs> I, I have done the math. I foresay, I gave up like 5 million in incremental gain um, off of a very, you know, tens of thousands of, of premium, uh, which, you know, it is what it is, it is what but, it is. but, but yes. Um, so I had done some de-risking of those calls ahead of holiday sales. I didn't put them back on after the price, you know, rose. Cause it's like, ah, I, I can't justify paying the premium. It was painful, but I sold some shares that before mania week. And then for the first time in my life, that Sunday before that mania week, I watched the big short. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got it. Got it. So, um, and so at what point, what point are you out of your position now? And at what point did you get out of your position? Sure. So the ma I call it the mania week, right? Like the week that it just took over the world. Um, that Monday, it opened up and closed over. Uh, I forget what the close was at. It got over a hundred and mid hundreds at one point. So I wrote covered calls, you know, roughly at the money ish. Um, and, and basically was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get taken out here because as I noted, we thought the bull case was in the high one hundreds. So it had 
effectively front ran and gotten there. It's like, okay, if I thought the bull case was, you know, high 100s by late 20, you know, by 2023, then if, <laughs> if it's there now, I need to take money off the table. So I wrote those covered calls. But then on Tuesday, Chamath tweeted that he was buying GameStop calls in the morning. And I kind of took that as a, I think there's something more going on here, given the elevated short interest, uh, the just strangeness with which the stock had been moving. Um, you know, we'd been observing that there was a lot of bot attacks on activity. There was a lot of sh misinformation campaigns from apparently short sellers. You know, we, at the time I thought Melvin was the largest short and it was later, I think found to be true that they were the largest short and uh, they, they had been you know, running some not so nice bot campaigns it seemed. But um, yeah, after Chamath tweeted that, I closed out my covered calls. Uh, I proceeded to average an exit inclusive of those assigned shares at 60, of about 270 because I had no idea Elon Musk was going to tweet GameStonk that Wednesday after hours and send the stock up another 14 billion in market cap. So okay. I, I certainly was a beneficiary. I think Senvest, another large hedge fund that had a position in the Wall Street Journal reporting also took that tweet from Musk as like, okay, this is it. Uh, this is peak mania. And I also kind of saw it that way. It was fun. It, I think, but for the you know, the buy button, the the settlement clog, the settlement process clogging up <laughs> the ability of retail to keep piling into the trade, it would have gone past a thousand, but you know, no one can do that. Um, and with hindsight, no one knows where it would have gone for sure. Uh, but I, I exited almost in full by the end of that week. And then I started to write cash secured puts in the double digits uh, with the volatility, as I noted, in these nosebleed levels. So I generated meaningful income um, on the downslope as well. But regrettably, I didn't get any assigned by the time the stock got down to, you know, about 40. And I really wanted to get back in at 40. Uh, but Keith Gill, you know, doubled down, he spoke to Congress and said, I like the stock. And uh, then whatever happened in late February happened, and it went off to the races. Um, I have 100 shares today, which is, you know, a little less than 1% allocation. Gotcha. So let's, um let's talk about one of the most interesting uh, parts of your story, I think, and I think it's tied to what you're doing now. You said yes. you found out their e-commerce order numbers were sequ sequential. And so you started like crowdsourcing on social media. Was this Reddit or Twitter? Um, Stock or, tweets, Twitter, all of them. All over. Yep. Okay. So you're on, you're on social media saying, you know, if you've made an online order on GameStop, tell me what your order number is. Right. And I'm sure you're probably just like making some orders <laughs> just to see kind of where you're coming in. I was. And so you're just tracking like these people's like, okay, how high are they going up and how fast are they going up? And now you're with Woot Capital and that has to do with crowdsourcing. So, so tell me like, is, is this story kind of how you discovered the power of crowdsourcing or like, just tell me what you're doing now with, with crowdsourcing. Yeah, that example I think is a, is a prime one. If you have a company whose you know, e-commerce is yielding sequential order numbers, well, obviously hedge funds and the like pay for credit card data, which is going to get you, you know, part of the of the way there. And at the time, I did have a friend who worked in a in a space that he was able to share some of that, you know, whether it's Fiserv or or Yodly or whatever the intermediary, you know, that sells the data. So I, I kind of had some data that was more than maybe the lay retail person. But yeah, I viewed it as things like the sequential order number crowdsourcing. Um, if you have someone who's maybe going out to a store and taking photos of inventory levels or sharing conversations, like it, it's really gathering up, I think, all of those nuggets of information, understanding there's a lot of noise. And try, we're trying with Whoop to create a social platform where Broadly, retail investors can come together. They can see other people's research. They can contribute their research. You know, we're we're not trying to say we're arbiters of of what is and isn't necessarily a good investment. I mean, we're we're not gonna at this point. We're not disclosing yet any positions we may or may not have taken. But we are a private investment fund. You know, we are obviously in the business of trying to grow. You know, our own investments. But we very much so um, have come about as a byproduct of this GameStop story. And we very much believe there's this novel um, thesis that we have that you, you know, what happened with GameStop with people really, you know, turning over the rocks in unique ways, maybe that others, um, not, not knocking you, Matt, you said, yeah, if somebody brought the idea to me, I'd, I'd have said, get the heck out of here. Um, you know, we, we think that it, you need to have as many discussions as you can, um, try to approach these things in good faith and try to come to an objective truth and understand you're never gonna have all the information, but more is better than less. And and try to, you know, 
yield alpha in that way is, is kind of what we're looking to do. And we're going to have some social programs. We're going to do philanthropic programs. But at its core, we're investors. And we're going to look to achieve alpha. Um, and we believe that this concept of you know, social research can, can do just that. That's, uh, that's fascinating. So I grew up as an investor on discussion boards. And like, you know, I remember being into like, you know, semi companies and like, so we'd all be like on a discussion board saying, okay, there's a YouTube video where they open up the phone and they count the chips made from these manufacturers. And, you know, here's the Samsung phone and here's the iPhone when they open it up and they just count like, okay, these are made by Corvo or Skyworks or, you know, you know, there's Samsung chips and, and, and things like that. And these discussion boards, you know, they went back years and years and, yep. you know, so like I dig through the archives at times and like, you'd find people like researching a company and saying, I live close to their manufacturing facility and I went by on the weekend and the parking lot was full. So that means they're like making things or paying overtime or paying for a yeah. second shift on the weekend and just things like that, um, that just can, obviously you have to follow the numbers and all the filings, you, you have to do that. But like things exactly. like that can just add a little more color or understanding like what could be going on. I, I totally agree. And that's that's the thing we, we agree and we appreciate and you and I clearly both agree too that look, you got to do the, the legwork of looking at the, the quarterly filings, looking at the 8Ks, et cetera. Uh, that goes without saying, and you're not going to necessarily, no one's getting an edge off of that alone, right? That's like table stakes. You know, the days of Warren Buffett, you know, uncovering these gems because he read more, you know, 10Ks than anyone else. Well, well, everyone in the world's reading the 10Ks and the 10Qs and all these filings. So I don't think that that there's an edge in that, you know, publicly available information. But what you just said, like looking at parking lots, whether it's satellite imagery, I know funds use that for commodities and and for other, you know, goods. Like um, I mentioned, I worked at a, at a transport company, and you, you see satellite imagery of, you know, hey, what are the what are their inventory levels look like at their, you know, used truck lots? Um, you know, inventory is building up, and yes, uh, so, some of that there's not an edge per se, but it's like that incremental information, the credit card data that we talked about. You know, that it's like how can you get more. And to me, it's like you need as many eyeballs as possible. And your point about discussion boards, yeah, I mean, that that's the first step. And it's like, how can we make this an interactive value added community? Um, we just started in January. So we have a long way to go. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. I'll, I'll be interested uh, to follow that. Uh, like in another more recent example would be like, you know, the power of Twitter, like the power of my yes. like, and you know, I am far from like, an influencer or, or like a mega following, but the power of my network has been incredible lately. Like when, you know, these uh, ATT and IDFA changes that Apple made to their privacy policies and I have a Facebook holding or a, a meta holding and, uh, Same. <laughs> and I wanted to know like, okay, so like how, how do these things uh, like really affect like advertising on the platform? And I just reached out to like a few people I know and, and was able to like, you know, through the generosity of their time, like they talked to me for like an hour and saying, it affects this businesses this way. And that's really meaningful, but it doesn't affect these businesses or, you know, like big brands can adjust and they're fine. You know, and just different ways like that to understand a little more nuance that you get totally. through the filings and uh, conference calls. But uh, that's, that's fascinating. So uh, Rod, why don't you just real briefly explain like what, so this was, a, I mean, this is a fascinating story <laughs> that, that just like, you know, just blew up. But like, how do you describe your overall investment philosophy? Yeah, I would say, you know, we, I think before we started recording, you, you asked me about that. And it, it, you know, at its core, it's value. But appreciating value isn't just limited to what exists on a balance sheet or what you're seeing on you know, current income statement and cash flow statement. I think there's been extensive writing um, I always butcher his name. Mike Mobison has written about you know the value of real options, right? And uh, that that type of stuff, you have to consider everything or try to consider everything. You're never going to know everything, but it's it's value at its core. Appreciating that things like optionality, transformation, etc., those things in of themselves have value, and you need to consider them and not just be tethered to, yeah, they've got this on their PPE and they're trading at book value. I think that's a, a limited view of value. I think that truly investing with a value mindset, you have to include all of those things. And it's as simple as when you do include all those things, do you perceive that current value of the equity, you know, given what you think the future cash flows ought to look like, 
gives you enough uh, upside and obviously things like margin of safety uh, apply depending on your risk tolerance. Uh, like right now, for example, Playboy is PLBY group is my largest position in my personal account. And it's another one of those. If you look at the financial statements today, and you're like, what, what the heck are you doing, Rod? You know, this thing trades at a crazy price to sales multiple. They're not making money. And, and it, I think is a prime example where you have a transformation story going on. You have a business that has a lot of uh, social equity, if you will, brand awareness, things that don't show up on its balance sheet that are unique to the Playboy brand and, and love to talk more about Playboy and, and my thesis there, but just from a philosophy perspective, I think that fits in nicely where you, you know, I'm, I think of myself as a value guy, but I, I think that growth investors are also value investors. Everyone who is a serious investor is a value investor because they're buying something that they think is worth more than what it's priced at today. I mean, it, it's as simple as that. Sure. So let's, let's, let's talk about Playboy briefly, because if you, if we were just talking and, and you told me like, yeah, my biggest position is Playboy, my immediate reaction is what uh, my immediate reaction would have been if you told me your, your biggest holding in 2018 was GameStop. Well, this is a, <laughs> a, a legacy media company. Yes. Uh, you know, the world is changing in that industry and you know, they're, they're, they're going to be left behind. So why, why even like explore that? So like, what, what do you find so compelling in Playboy as an investment? Yeah, so I'm coming up on a year having been invested. So they just came back public uh, in with, through, a, through a DSPAC, which is inherently something that raises red flags in a lot of investors, and rightfully so, because plenty of these SPAC mergers have been um, questionable at best. But look, this was a company that has, since 1953, they were founded. And obviously, Hugh Hefner founded the company He's passed away several years ago. Hugh Hefner and his family have zero involvement with current management. Um, it, that has been the case for several years. They were not good managers. Uh, they, they were not good business people. You know, Hugh, Hugh obviously was entrepreneurial. He built a brand, you know, from nothing. Um, this Playboy brand, this, this idea of, you know, it, Rachel Weber is the, the chief strategy officer at, at Playboy. She um, had been at National Geographic and, and both she and Ben Cohn, the current CEO, have talked extensively like this is the original lifestyle brand. And uh, I think, Matt, your point about the perception is this is a legacy media company. Yes, the business used to be media. They used to print a magazine. They used to sell those magazines. Um, they have since early 2020 not printed a physical magazine. They've been deliberately transitioning the business model. You know, it, it, if we think about the stages of the company, early on, media empire that Hef built. Um, transitioned away to a licensing and media business with the licensing cash flows supporting this money losing media business. They've shuttered the media end of the business. They still have licensing cash flows. They have over 400 million in contracted licensing cash flows through the back half of the decade. They have a very impressive licensing business in China in terms of just the size of the business. They've got over a billion in e-commerce sales going on associated with the Playboy brand. Now, because it's licensing, they're not seeing those revenues all flow through the P&L. They're getting, you know, their two, three, whatever, 4% um, because they have bad, they negotiated a lot of bad deals with the prior management. Um, RISV Travers is the PE firm that took them private in 2011. And Ben Cohn was a partner at RISV when it happened. So RISV knows the company, I think, very well, knows the assets of the company very well. Uh, RISV hasn't sold any shares, even when the company you know, ran up multiples of what it despacked at and had a share unlocked. So clearly, RISV sees value far beyond the current price as well. Um, so you have this brand that has 97% global unaided brand awareness that has historically not realized revenues on its own P&L because they licensed the name out to whatever knickknack, you know, apparel or consumer good it was. And that was losing money printing this magazine that in the era of, you know, the internet is just simply much less relevant, at least as a physical commodity. But I think when they lean into the lifestyle angle, if you look at the partnership they have with PacSun and Misguided, you see younger people consuming their product. Uh, recently, the company said that, um, I think it was, 50% of sales were from under 34. Um, no, sorry, two thirds of sales. 
it's a meaningful uh, component of sales that come from younger people. So it's actually, um, I think it, it speaks to younger people. You know, look, I'm wearing a Playboy shirt right now that's about federal legalization, and it's like a decades-old, you know, Playboy, um, you know, bunny caricature. Like they've been on the leading edge, I think, with a lot of these social things, like involvement with Normal for for marijuana legalization. Um, they've, you know, been very in, uh, good supporters of the LGBT community, putting um, Bretman Rock on one of their last, uh, you know, digital covers. Uh, you know, a, a young man. You know, dressing up as a bunny. So I think that there's a lot of that kind of cultural um, value that, again, they haven't realized. And how are they going to realize it? So there's two categories in their product uh, that they're kind of shifting to direct to consumer with the licensing that is a good business, right? Licensing high, you know, high margin, high recurring revenues. So they're leaning into the direct to consumer as well as digital. And there's the direct to consumer angle of a, things like apparel, things like streetwear, things like lingerie, swimwear, et cetera. The company was opportunistic in June. They did a follow-on issuance of, I think, 4.7 million shares at like 46 bucks. They netted $200 million um, and they bought Honey Burdett with it. Honey Burdett's an Australian lingerie and you know, sexual wellness brand uh, selling you know, their own um, designed in-house apparel and toys, gross margins, the CFO noted in January at a conference for Honey Bird Dead are over 75%. So you've got like this legacy brand that everyone knows about that they hadn't successfully monetized in the past. They're shifting the business to monetize in a different way going forward. Um, and I haven't even talked about Centerfold or, or NFT, which are, you know, you could even value those things, I think, at zero and still see upside from here. But yeah, I think it's one of those things that there's a lot going on. If you just look at the financials, I think you're going to you know, miss the opportunity. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a growth stock, but I kind of see it as, yeah, actually, I think it's value because you have a lot of value that's just not showing up today and will show up in the years to come. Uh, that's that's interesting. So I, I'll have to I'll have to take a deeper look at that, and and I'm gonna try to keep a better uh, open mind, which I think is like uh, probably a key to being a good investor is not to being so close minded to different opportunities. Um, thanks for sharing your time today, Rod. Where can people find you if they want to follow you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter actively at Rod Alsman. Uh, and I'm on different social media. Um, my username that I use everywhere, and I have since like fifth grade, as noted in the. GameStop movie is Uberkicks, U-B-E-R-K-I-K-Z-11. So happy to talk with anybody, anywhere, anytime. All right, excellent. Um, Rod, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Matthew Cochran. We're 7Investing, and we're here to empower you to invest in your future. Have a great day, everyone.